So this is about oxygen dissociation curves. So we're going to look at what is an oxygen oxygen dissociation curve and what is the effect of carbon dioxide concentration on the curve and why does this happen? So just a little note about what partial pressure means. So the partial pressure is the amount of gas present in a mixture and it's measured by the pressure that it contributes to the total pressure of the gas mixture. So as an example, normal atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascals. And as you probably know from like GCSE, 21% of the atmosphere is uh, made up of oxygen. So therefore, the pre partial pressure that oxygen exerts on the total pressure is 21%. So 21% of 100 kilopascals is 21 kilopascals. So normal atmospheric conditions, oxygen has a partial pressure of 21 kilopascals. So oxygen dissociation curves always have like a sigmoidal and S shape curve. And the reason is because, the, as we said last lesson, there's four heme groups which can carry an oxygen molecule each. So a hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen, four oxygens. So therefore, when the first oxygen binds, initially the hemoglobin is quite tightly wound. The polypeptides are in quite a closely united format. So it's really difficult to get that first oxygen molecule to bind. However, once the first oxygen molecule is bind, so this is why that this bit is quite um, not as steep. Once the first oxygen molecule is bound, then the polypeptide unwinds a little bit. So that means that it loads the next three oxygens a lot more easily than it loaded the first one which is why that this middle bit is really steep because once the first one is bound then the polypeptide unwinds a little bit and it's easier to bind the next three molecules at the other end of the curve because the hemoglobin is almost saturated um, then it levels off again so it tails off at high oxygen concentrations so each we did kind of touch on this last lesson each type of hemoglobin changes under different conditions so there's lots of different dissociation curves so if the curve is further to the left that means it has a greater affinity or greater take up of hemoglobin for oxygen so it doesn't release it as easily it just takes it up really well if it moves to the right, and that means it has a lower affinity or lower take-up of hemoglobin for oxygen, so it's more easily released to the tissues. So that tends to be more um, active, high metabolism animals. So carbon dioxide concentration is the thing that actually affects the hemoglobin molecule and changes its affinity. So in carbon dioxide, hemoglobin reduces its affinity for oxygen, so it gives it off more easily. It, and that is what's known as the Bohr effect. So you can see here that at high concentrations of carbon dioxide, the curves move to the right. So that is called the Bohr effect. And that means that oxygen is unloaded more so it's got a lower affinity for oxygen because it unloads it, it gives it off to the tissues more. So at the lungs, where there's quite a uh, high partial pressure of oxygen and there's low carbon dioxide concentration at the lungs. So the lungs is high oxygen concentration but low carbon dioxide concentration. If there's low carbon dioxide concentration, it means that the Hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, so it takes it up more easily at the lungs because there's low carbon dioxide concentration. And then it kind of keeps hold of it as it travels through the blood. But then when it gets to the rapidly respiring tissues, the muscle cells, um, if obviously the muscle is respiring, it's going to give off more carbon dioxide. So in the tissues, there's going to be a high concentration of carbon dioxide. And that means that the curve is going to shift to the right. 
So the hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen, which means it gives off oxygen more easily to the tissues. So it's got a lower affinity, it gives off the oxygen to the tissues, to the muscles, to the spiring tissues, and the curve moves to the right. So that shift to the right, because of the high carbon dioxide concentration, is known as the Bohr shift. And it's to do with the fact that carbon dioxide uh, forms carbonic acid in the blood. It makes the blood more acidic, and that causes the hemoglobin to change shape. So, as I said before, at the lungs, at the gas exchange surface, there is a high concentration of oxygen, but a low concentration of carbon dioxide. Therefore, the hemoglobin has a higher affinity or higher take-up of oxygen. And then, so it loads the oxygen more easily, and then it travels through the blood. Once it gets to the respiring tissues, carbon dioxide is produced by the respiring cells. Carbon dioxide... Um, in liquid forms carbonic acid so it makes the blood more acidic so it lowers the pH of the blood and that lower pH changes the shape of the hemoglobin so that it has a lower affinity for oxygen. Therefore if it has a lower affinity for oxygen it's going to release more of that oxygen to the respiring tissue. So the higher the, ooh, the, higher the rate of respiration the more carbon dioxide the tissues produce, the lower the pH, the more the hemoglobin shape changes, therefore the more readily the oxygen is unloaded, therefore more oxygen is available for respiration in the tissues. Just another thing, just to show that there is a capability to increase the amount of oxygen that is given to the tissues as we respire more. So, Normally, at the lungs, the haemoglobin becomes saturated with oxygen. It picks up all four oxygen molecules with each of the heme groups. But most of the time, at rest, it actually only unloads one of the four molecules at the tissues. So it returns back to the lungs, the blood, with 75% saturation. So it, it starts off with all four it goes to the tissues, gives one off, and then returns to the blood with three out of the four hemoglobin. So it returns to the, uh, sorry, returns to the lungs with three out of the four oxygen molecules. So it returns to the lungs 75% saturated. And that is what this line shows. This is at the lungs where it's 100% saturated. This is when at rest, when it only gives one of the four molecule oxygens to the tissues and then returns 75% saturated. But when we're respiring really rapidly, when we're very active, then actually three of the four molecules get unloaded. So he picks up four at the lungs, it goes to the tissues, and then it gives off three of the four hemoglobin molecules, and then it returns to the lungs only 25% saturated because it only has one left. I don't know why it always keeps hold of one. Probably is a reason, but I don't know why. So that is just another lesson on uh, oxygen dissociation curves. Hopefully it's starting to make more sense now. So there's just one more lesson left on hemoglobin and oxygen dissociation curves.